All right, so in the last lecture, we found out that the ultimate inherent value is happiness, but we noticed an issue, right? We haven't really answered the question yet. What's the best life look like? Because there are multiple ways that we currently think we can realize a happy life, right? Some people think a happy life is family. Other people think a happy life is partying, so on and so forth, right? So is there an objective answer to this question? Uh, is the happy life... Uh, does the happy life consist in particular things or can it vary from person to person in what they find in what they find happiness in? Uh, and Aristotle says, no, there is in fact an objective answer to this question. And he's going to figure that out by looking at three different types of lives. And the first he calls the life of enjoyment. And this is the life that people lead when they equate happiness with pleasure. And so they spend their life trying to chase down pleasure all the time. Uh, Aristotle says, basically, they spend their life trying to satisfy the appetites that we share with the animals. In other words, you're just going after your base pleasure all the time because you think pleasure is what matters. So you're after food, sex, sleep, so on and so forth. Right? Uh, and Aristotle says, this is just the worst of the three lives you could lead because even though pleasure truly is important to somebody's life going well, right, pleasure is not happiness. If you're living the life of enjoyment, you're essentially a slave to your passions, right? You're failing to exercise the dignity of human nature. What does he mean there? Well, look, you have things, rationality and reason, that keep you or distinguish you from the rest of the animal kingdom. And when you live the life of enjoyment, you're reducing yourself to an animal, right? You're not using that thing that sets you apart from the animal kingdom. At least you're not using it very well, right? You're not maximizing it. You're not taking full advantage of that thing that is your function or purpose. Instead, you're sort of sitting with your animalistic desires and you're living that life, right? So that's what he means by it's failing to exercise the dignity of human nature. You're not really living up to your full potential if all you're doing is chasing down pleasure all the time. Animals can do that. To really uh, maximize your life, you have to live up to your full potential and that's going to require you using your reason. Uh, the second life is the political or active life. Uh, people who live this life equate happiness with honor. Uh, and so they're doing good deeds for the community or for the state, whatever it is, right? Because they want to be recognized for what they're doing, right? They want the accolades. They want the, the honor. They want people praising them for doing such good things, so on and so forth. Aristotle says this is an improvement over the life of enjoyment, right? This is better. Um, it requires us to exercise our rationality, right? We can't do good deeds for the community unless we can figure out what the right thing is to do. Uh, solving community issues is a very difficult thing to do. It's going to require us to use our reason. So, okay, good. We're realizing some of our potential here. We're setting ourselves apart from the animals with what we're focusing on in life. And he thinks it reflects superior character, right? Because you're not just caring about yourself. Although thing, honor is ultimately for yourself, right? You could get honor in different ways. Uh, but you're doing good deeds for the community. So that's also reflecting a superior character. But Aristotle says, look, this also can't be happiness, right? This can't be the best life. Because we don't just want to be recognized as somebody who appears good, right? We don't want honor because we merely appear good. We want honor because we want to be recognized as good, right? So honor can apply both to the person who is in fact good and who merely appears good. Um, and so the life of honor can't be what we're really chasing down. And then also honor depends on the whims or attitudes of society, right? So if you if you go after the political or active life, if you're chasing down honor, uh, that's not going to lead to a life of happiness because what's honorable changes from culture to culture over and even within the same culture over time. If you think about what an honorable man in the 50s looks like versus today, I think that'll give you a pretty good uh, example, right? The culture has changed and uh, honorable actions before aren't all seen as honorable today, although there is clearly some overlap. Okay, so the best life then, as we've been hinting at the whole time, is the life of contemplation. 
And so these, this is the life uh, of people who equate happiness with the exercise of our reasoning capacities towards the structure of the intelligible world. In other words, it's a life in which we are fully realizing the potential of the powers we have that distinguish us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Right? Remember, happiness uh, for Aristotle is close to saying the same thing as flourishing. So when does a human flourish? Well, the human flourishes when they live up to their full potential. And we can only do that by living up to the full potential of our reasoning capacities, since that's what our function or purpose is, and that's what sets us apart. Okay, so here's some uh, quotes from Aristotle discussing this notion. Right? The good for man is an actuality of the soul in accordance with virtue. And if more than one virtue exists, then accordance with the virtue that is the end the most in a complete life. If happiness is an actuality in accordance with virtue, it is reasonable for it to express the supreme virtue, which will be the virtue of the best thing. But since the best thing is mind, or whatever else seems by nature to be the ruler and leader, and to hold in thought the fine and divine by being uh, itself either divine or the most divine part in us, the actuality of it in accordance with its proper virtue would be complete happiness. This is theoretical, as we have said. Okay, so uh, you have, if there are multiple virtues, right, the most important virtue is the one that is closest to what looks like mind, right, your reasoning, um, whatever is the ruler of the leader of the person and can think about the divine and the truth, so on and so forth, right? So uh, if we have those virtues, then we need knowledge of it, right? Acting in accordance with proper virtue would be happiness, right? So if we have those virtues and we act in accordance with them, that would be complete happiness. And he says, this is theoretical wisdom. All right, so we're going to break this down a little bit, but that's the rough overview of what he thinks here. Uh, so first we need to look at the, the function argument. So we saw when we were discussing the metaphysics that the whole universe is just chuck full of teleology, right? Everything has purpose. Uh, everything has a function. And so we can ask ourselves, what's the purpose or function of a human being? And we already went over this uh, in the metaphysics, but he goes over it again in the ethics. So we're going to pay a little bit of attention here, but I won't harp on it. Um, so we know our function is to exercise our power of rationality, right? That's what sets us apart from the animal kingdom. Uh, that is what allows us to emulate the first mover. Um, and that is the sort of thing that moves us, right? into becoming most like the first mover. But now we can ask ourselves, okay, well, we're looking for the good here, right? We're not just saying what is a human function. We're looking for the best life. So if you're going to be a good one of your kind, right, a thing must perform its function well, and it becomes closer to the best, the more excellently it performs that function, right? So you can just perform your function a little bit, right? You could reason about uh, the nature of the universe sometimes, and you could do a pretty bad job at it, but at least you're trying, right? That would be you exercising your function poorly, and so that would be you living uh, a less than ideal life. So to live the ideal life, the best life, the flourishing life, the happiest life, you need to perform your function as excellently as possible. All right, so think about knives for a second, right? A knife, a knife has the purpose or function of cutting, we say a dull knife is not a good knife. We say it's a bad knife because it does not perform its function well. And a dull knife either doesn't cut through the thing or it's a struggle to cut through the thing. It's doing a poor job at performing its function. A regular knife, we say, is fine. That's a good knife. It's performing the function well. Could be better, but at least it's getting the job done. Uh, and then a Tori Hanzo blade is the best since it performs that function as excellently as possible. Um, for those of you unfamiliar, it's a, a sword maker in um, Kill Bill that I'm referring to here, right? The blade uh, is supposed to be just insanely sharp, cuts through anything, right? It's performing that function of cutting as excellently as possible. So now we need to ask ourselves when it comes to, we understand what it means to be an excellent knife, right? We understand what it means to, if knives had lives, right? Live the best knife life, right? It's by performing that function of cutting well. So what do we do with humans? What is human excellence like? In other words, when are we like the Hanzo blade, right? How do we perform our function excellently to be the best of our kind, right? And live the best life. 
Well, Aristotle says we're the best of our kind uh, when we exercise our rationality excellently or when we fully realize what it is that makes us distinct as human beings. So he says this is clearly the life of contemplation. But you probably want more detail than that, right? That doesn't, excuse me, that doesn't tell us uh, exactly what we need to do yet, right? What does it mean to fully realize our rationality or reasoning? Well, he thinks those abilities are most fully realized when we're thinking about or grasping the ultimate truths. In other words, the most excellent life is the life in which we have theoretical wisdom. Right, so when you have theoretical wisdom, it's not just that you think about this stuff, it's that you've thought about the nature of the universe and you've actually grasped the truths of that universe. Right, so it's sort of like another way of thinking about it is you've come to have knowledge of these things. Right, so instead of just sort of thinking about it casually or thinking about it, but you're still confused, right, you've thought about it and you've grasped some of these ultimate truths. And the more you have, the better your life is going, right? When you have wisdom about these theoretical matters. Why is this? Well, because the best life is going to be one in which we are emulating the unfir unmoved first mover. And when we're emulating it as best we can. And since the first mover, right, remember, the first mover doesn't actually move. It's just sort of sitting there locked in eternal contemplation of the truths of the universe. It is sort of like the uh, eternal mind, right? The mind that's just sitting there thinking about everything, understanding and grasping the truths of the universe. So since we perform our function to emulate the first mover, our life's going to be better the more like the first mover we are. So the life of contemplation is a life of using rationality to read into the intelligible structure of the universe and then to grasp these ultimate truths. And so we're happy and flourishing as human beings the closer we get to that goal. So that's why uh, excellency looks like grasping knowledge, right? Having wisdom, because when we have that wisdom, we are more perfectly emulating the first mover. And that's our function or purpose anyway. So, of course, that's when we're flourishing as human beings. Okay. So you might say, what about everything else? Right? So you have this life uh, where you're thinking about the truth all day. But don't things like... Don't things get in the way of that all the time, right? Other things that we think are valuable, right? So you're trying to study uh, and your family keeps making too much noise. You're trying to study uh, and so if you still live with your parents, right, they're asking you to do chores. If you live on yourself and you have kids, your kids are running around destroying the house. Right? So your family is actually distracting you from studying or living a life of contemplation. If you're chasing down power in like a career setting, uh, or in a political setting, well, then isn't that distracting you from contemplating? And if you're chasing down money, right, isn't that going to distract you from contemplating? Right? Don't all of these other things in life keep us from the truth? So shouldn't we just ignore all of these other things if Aristotle's right? Luckily, that's not the case. Right? Aristotle doesn't say ignore everything else, right? Give up on your family, give up on your job, stop chasing all money, uh, and just sit there and think all day, right? Why? Doesn't he say that? Well, because look, all of those things are still going to be instrumentally valuable in a human life. Right? We want to set up our lives so that we can spend as much time as possible living the life of contemplation. We can spend as much time as possible thinking about the ultimate truths of the universe. But we can't do that unless our environment is set up properly. And we can't set up our environment properly without things like friends, money, and power. So let's focus on the money example because I think that one's the easiest, right? So if you're extremely poor, you can't live the best life because all day you're just scrounging to survive and make ends meet, right? You're not going to get time to contemplate or you're going to get home from your 16-hour shift and you're going to be exhausted. You're not going to have the mental energy to contemplate. Uh, the rich, with all their leisure time, can very easily contemplate should they decide to do so. So... Aristotle's advice here is that we should chase all of these other instrumentally valuable things, but we should only chase them in moderation, right? We should chase them just enough so that we can live a perfect life of contemplation or maximize our time in contemplation. But you shouldn't actually chase those things as an end in themselves. You still have to keep in focus the idea that contemplation is the ultimate end and everything else is just instrumentally valuable for that. 
uh, in the next lecture, we'll determine what the second best life is. Thank you.